Hey guys, it's Joe's Julian. This week I'm sitting down with Supervising Director Clay Hall to talk all things King of the Hill. I want to give a special shout out to a couple of our patrons that help make this podcast possible. Bill, Brent, Brittany, Eight-Legged Bird, Jacob, Nick, and Patrick. Thank you all so much for your support. It truly means a lot. If you want to become a patron and help support this show, check the show notes below and sign up today. Now let's get to my chat with Clay. changing back king of the hill for me al you guys have always heard you know greatest adult animated show of all time so i gotta know man clay how do you go from doing what you're doing to getting on king of the hill yeah thanks julian um you know it was a pretty cool experience uh, once let me say right up front that uh you know I, i'm it's a humbling experience to be in animation I, I love it it's probably the most collaborative art form there is out there it takes, you know, every individual it literally takes a village to make one of these things. So it goes without saying that there's a, a thousand people that I'm grateful that I got to work with and, and basically thank them for my success. So that goes without saying. But uh, I had finished up a gig just, just to give you a sort of a start of how this how I got on to King of the Hill. I finished up a gig at Amblin and I rolled right onto The Simpsons. A buddy of mine from Cal Arts, Jim Reardon, was a director on The Simpsons. And they were looking, they had an open uh, slot for a timer. And I knew a lot about animation timing, uh, studying classical animation, Disney animation. And, and uh, uh, I was on uh, Family Dog for Universal Amblin, which was a uh, Brad Bird uh, mm -hmm. episode. And I learned basically a lot about timing from there. Anyways, uh, that got me onto The Simpsons. And then I was on The Simpsons for basically, uh, I think about 27 episodes from 92 to 98 and worked my way up from a timer uh, to story artist to assistant director and then finally as a director. And after I directed that episode, which was called Natural Born Kissers, um, which actually was received very well, it did. It was a, just a really well-written episode by Matt Salmon, who's still on the show. Um, uh, it, it got... Greg, or Mike, or Wes, or all those guys as a group basically found out about it, found, saw the episode, and it, being at Film Rome, and Film Roman was working on both productions at the same time, King, the King of the Hill guys asked me to come on board. And let me back up, earlier in that 27-episode in that, uh, span of being on The Simpsons, one of the first episodes I worked on was Lisa's Wedding, which, yeah. act, which was written by Greg. Greg Daniels and Conan O'Brien. So I actually met Greg really early on. And I think he sort of remembered that um, years later. So I got picked up uh, for King of the Hill. It was in its infancy. I mean, it, it, they had just recently gotten the green light. So there wasn't even a production role rolling yet. And uh, they gave me a call. I said, yeah, I'll, I'll jump ship, which was kind of uh, a scary thing for me to do because The Simpsons was so... Uh, powerful and well-known and established and jumping on to King of the Hill, which I, I thought was funny. I saw the promo on it. By the way, have you ever seen the original pencil test that Mike and Greg did? Was that the one where they were pitching in the, uh, the executive, they were pitching to the executives. Yes. I think I've yes. seen, I want to say I have, I don't know if it was one of those back behind the scene or back behind the DVD scenes, whatever those things are called director's cuts for one of the first couple seasons. But I think yeah. I have. Okay. So I saw that and I thought it was really funny. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to give this a shot. I, and I shifted gears. Um, and then, as I said, it was King of the Hills infancy, in, infancy uh, and, and uh, they were just getting started. And uh, so Greg called a few of us down, John Rice, Wes, myself, and a couple of other people. And we were actually at the 20th Century Fox building in downtown LA. And we got to work directly with the writers. So we were, we were designing characters and sort of fleshing out the idea of the show uh, while Mike and Greg were sort of ironing out, um, you know, script ideas and, and pitches. And it was really a, a great period of time on the show to be able to work with those guys, literally directly with Greg Daniels and Mike Judge and Wes Archer. Um, and that's basically how I got started on the show. I don't know if I answered, I guess I answered your question. I mean, oh. basically, you know, that, that, that started sort of the momentum. And because I was there early and I guess because 
they had seen some of my pre previous work, I was slotted as a uh, three shower. So I actually got three full episodes a year, which was a full low. Um, and I did that for a couple of years, or actually I think about two and a half years. And then Wes left the show and I ended up getting promoted along with John to supervising director. But that's how it all started. It started from The Simpsons, directed an episode, Greg and Mike grabbed me, jumped ship, and I was there for almost six years. Now, you, I wanted to circle back to something you said just a second ago. Uh, you, you had said that you jumped ship. Obviously, The Simpsons, they were iconic when, when King of the Hill was coming out. I mean, you're probably in season, what, eight? seven eight yeah. somewhere around there for first for the simpsons at that time um yeah. what was that final like push to say hey, i'm gonna jump ship what was there something that clicked something that happened when you just want to work with these guys what was it yeah well a couple things uh, first of all uh in in reality directors on the simpsons it's pretty tough to get a directing gig mm -hmm. and although i had worked my way up i wasn't in director rotation so which i would have had to step back down and then wait for another slot to come up so there's no guarantee when I was gonna get the next episode. King of the Hill, as I mentioned, I saw that really funny story reel, the pitch reel. And I laughed, I thought it was really funny. I was a fan of Greg already from mm -hmm. The Simpsons. I was a fan of Mike Judge from Beavis and Butthead. I saw that, it was funny. I thought, okay, you know what? It's, it's in the same building. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe worst case scenario, if that didn't work out, I can come back, but you know what? I'm gonna go for it because I think I think it's unique and that's what made me do the job beautiful and uh how long did you work with greg when you were over at the simpsons uh just uh probably two years maybe two or three years and he left he left fairly early on uh it's when conan got the show i mean somewhere in there they they both went their separate ways greg went to develop more television conan went on to his talk show um, and I'm not sure what year that was, but I got to work with him for a few times on The Simpsons. And, and you know, what's great when you work on these shows and you're part of the crew, uh, not all the crew gets to go, which is unfortunate, but usually the directors and the assistant directors, um, you know, you sit down with the writers and the Fox executives and you're in the animatic screening room. It's all dark and you, you screen your episode and you see how it plays. And it's just a, it's a wonderful film experience uh, to be in the, the culture of hearing these really smart guys talk about certain things, why some jokes work, why some don't. And you're sitting there thinking, I could have done that better. Or, Hey, I pulled that one off. That one worked well. It's just a really cool thing to be able to experience doing that, you know? Oh, absolutely. I can imagine. And, you know, working with those guys, you know, we all know Conan O'Brien, we all know Greg. Um, what was, what was Greg like at the Simpsons? And then what was Greg like at, at King of the Hill? Cause everybody knows that, you know, he, he kind of got his, I don't want to say he made his name because he made his name in the Simpsons and I'm pretty sure he made his name even before then, but there was just every story I've ever heard about Greg has just been fascinating. So what was your experience like with him at the Simpsons? what did you learn from him over there? And then what'd you learn from him over at King of the Hill? Well, I learned right away that he was a smart guy. Um, they're both really smart guys and man, Conan, but, um, just, you know, I think even maybe even Chuck touched on it too about timing. Timing is a big deal to really make comedy work and like not to cut on a joke and, and to make your setups and your, and your, um, you know, the characters, make them believable, make them relatable, make them feel real. And you get taken out of that cartoon world and you're going with the story, man, and you're feeling the emotion and, the, and it seems real. Even though it's a two-dimensional drawing, it's crazy how it works. And I, that's what I learned from him most of all was um, keep it real, man. Keep it relatable and, and be aware of the joke. Break it down in your script and, and don't, you know, keep it funny. Don't step on yeah. it. Don't cut on it. Make Absolutely. It Absolutely. Now you get on King of the Hill and you came on when it was, the production was very, very limited. Um, what were some of the things that they were, they were really trying to push or, or since you being there at the early days, I got to imagine that you saw just a, a huge evolution of the show from start to finish from when you left. Um, what were some of those early meetings like, you know, sitting around just trying to get the show off the ground? Yeah, it was really, it was really cool because you're basically brainstorming, um, you know, uh, a new show and it, you know, 
with with uh, Mike being from Texas and Wes being from Texas and Greg and the the writers they went down and did a, a you know their time in in Austin and and sort of tried to absorb the culture and then they come back and talk about it um, just listening to their stories about the locals and and Mike growing up and and his friends and dad and 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 things like that you know it was just really exciting to be a part of. And then uh, John and myself and Wes would basically be drawing, listening to these guys talk mm -hmm. and trying to develop the characters, you know, and design the characters. And, and Mike would weigh in on those too, obviously, because, you know, it was Mike's look all the way. So he had to sign off on everything. But Wes had a firm grasp of, of Mike's style, and so did John Rice. John had worked on the original Beavis and Butthead. By the way, if you haven't spoken to John Rice, that's the guy you got to speak to, uh, because I don't think King of the Hill would have been the success that it became without John Rice. I really, he meant he meant that much to the show. He's an amazing talent, amazing talent, and all of that guy still to this day. But anyways. Yeah. So, you know, it was being in the atmosphere of listening to those guys in the Texas culture and hearing some funny stories and then drawing while we're listening to them was just a really special time. Well, I got to imagine, man, because it was a special time for so many fans that were tuning in day to day once the show started releasing. Um, now, I've, I've heard from multiple different multiple different people. I've heard from multiple people um, that uh, you you guys are fleshing out these character designs. Obviously, it's Mike's all the way through. You had to stay on spec. There was so many people that knew these characters from the get-go. But learning a new character, learning a new style, like, new style, especially Mike's, uh, you know, I've heard differing opinions on it. But uh, who were some of those characters that you had such a hard time doing in Mike's style? I've heard Bobby was very difficult. Yeah. Um, For me, they were all difficult. Yeah. I was... I was I was trained in the Disney style of round and soft edges and, you know, things like that, classical animation. And Mike's is the total opposite of that. So I had to sort of forget my training mm -hmm. and just kind of, you know, uh, I will say that part of my basic animation training was also life drawing. So drawing from life and drawing realistic drawing, I could lead into. And I was oh, pretty decent at that. So Mike's is more realistic, obviously. So, um, but it took me, it was tough to get used to his style and I still never really quite got it, but I got it close enough to where somebody else could come in and then really <laughs> zero it in. Um, but, uh, yeah, you know, uh, Bobby was always really tough. It's the shape of his head. It, it looks so simple, but, um, it was really, really hard. Um, Bill pretty easy. Hank's pretty easy. Uh, you know, Peggy's easy. Um, Cotton was a little tough because uh, he was just sort of a mix of a little bit of Bobby and Hank. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know, he was he was a little tough to get. But after a while, I really got I got him down well. But yeah, for me, I would have to go along with the with whatever the group. I think the group has said Bobby's probably the toughest. I would have to agree that he was probably the toughest. And I I can. Uh, take credit for nancy nancy was one of my uh designs that actually made it all the way through yeah um, yeah and she was based on an old sort of girlfriend with the hair and stuff like that so she ever um, reach out to you no <laughs> i never contacted <laughs> her or anything but uh that's uh you know i felt i felt good about pulling that one off no, I got to imagine, man. She was one of those fun characters. Uh, you know, whenever I think of Nancy, obviously, you know, her and John Redcorn are synonymous with yeah. each other. That's what you think of. But whenever I think of Nancy, I think of uh, obviously Dale, but the Manitoba, um, him going and suing Manitoba for making his wife hideous and ugly and all that other shit. So uh, such a such a fun character to play with. And I, I liked when you guys would take those characters. All these characters were very gray. It wasn't black or white. I mean, Hank was probably the only black or white character in there. It was... Yeah. There was no bending any kind of uh, – there was one way and one way only for him. But um, right, right. when when you guys are talking about, uh, you know, Mike being from Texas and Wes being from Texas, so they're trying to in, in, inject that Texas into this show, would they send you guys in the early days on any scouting, like going to – just to see the cities or anything like that? No, you know, I wish they would have. Uh, in, in the later years, I had thought about just road tripping there with some of the guys like Alan, who was working for me and Bill 
Whitney, all those guys. Uh, but no, they never did. And in hindsight, I think they should have because I think it would have mm. helped. Um, as as my career, you know, progressed beyond 20th century and ended up working for DreamWorks and Disney, right away, that's what those guys do. They send you out in the field to, you know, boots on the ground, get exposure to feel feel the environment, talk to the people, go to the restaurants, go to the bars and sort of absorb. And I wish we would have been able to do that. So it was always sort of a little bit secondhand information. But, you know, the scripts were so strong that it was going to work anyways. But it just would have been a nice little perk for sure. Now, obviously, happen. obviously, this is uh, not, not so much a hypothetical, but just one of those guest questions, I guess. Um, now, when you guys are when Texas is the theme for this show, because this, this show is Texas and Texas is this show. I mean, are you guys leaning on stories from, you know, I obviously said Mike's dad and his friends and stuff like that, but are you, what are you guys doing to research? Like what a Texan would sound like or what a Texan would do, or would that would just be the filter that it would have to go through for Wes when it came to that? Pretty much, pretty much. Yeah. It would be, it'd be Wes and Mike that were the filter for that to make sure that they got it into the script. I mean, there wasn't like something you could, a Texas movie that you would go and watch or something like that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we did our research, like, you know, if you had a, like I had a show called Arrowhead and it was a little bit on archeology. span So we, we did our research on, on that kind of stuff. I know Cashman did his research on the Dallas Cowboys and a bunch of guys did different things that way. But um, yeah, for the most part, it was Greg and Mike using the Texas filter to get it into the script. So it, it already sounded that way by the time we got it. Got you. And then uh, we're going to talk about those three episodes in just a second, because you picked three really fun episodes um, that you worked on to talk about. Um, with uh, with that being said, man, you know, we've, we've talked, uh, we've talked a little bit about Greg so far, but working with Mike, you know, early, the early days, right. This is the Beavis yeah. and Butthead guy. This is the guy that come and does King of the Hill. And yeah, I'm I'm always amazed whenever I see his name pop up and you're like, yeah, well, no shit. This is exactly why this show is so good and so funny. It's because his sensibility right there, his sense of humor. Um, yeah. What was it? What was it like working with him? Did What would you learn from from Mike that you would still use in your career today? Is there anything? Um, well, first of all, just let me say he was a, not only very genuine, but just a really nice guy. I mean, you can just tell he was just an ordinary, nice guy. He wasn't like some famous guy, even though he was famous. Um, so that right there is is pretty cool to see somebody that's pretty humble. Um, and he was just kind and he, and he would talk about certain things. I mean, he would ask how your family is. And he was very personable also as far as that goes. But um, and helpful, obviously, in the early, early days, he would give feedback really on sort of the do's and the don'ts of Texans and, and, and how they are and sort of to what your point was earlier about how, how to make it feel more realistic yeah. more Texas. Um, and, you know, he was there early on, especially in the summer months, he wasn't there year round at, at animatix, but during the summer he would fly in LA uh, cause he had a really nice place at Malibu and he would surf and he would come in the 20th century and watch the screenings and stuff and uh, give notes um, but he was, he was just a, a, a really great guy to work with. And I would say if I could take anything away from him, other than just how humble and kind he was, it was just that he was generous with his time too. He was never in a hurry, um, or brush you off, even though he didn't really know you, you know, it was, a you know, it was great to be around him, man. Oh, that sounds really cool. And, uh, one thing I love is when, when people can do, voices or imitations or accents. And I've heard so many stories about Mike doing them. And then they're also all fascinating. The fact that he can do somebody doing Hank, but if Hank had a cold or if Hank was from here, I, I just, I find that so fascinating. Would he, did you ever, were you ever around him when he would just delve into any character, Hank Boomhauer or one Beavis butthead, you know, did oh, yeah. he do that around that? Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 He would. And, and just instantly you're laughing or you're sitting there amazed, Yeah, you know, and, and it was always a treat to go to the records. I didn't make near as many as I would have liked to have, um, but I probably was at 50 or 60 of them. And mm. uh, I mean, uh, just magic, literally magic happening right in front of your eyes, man. You got a favorite you moment know? from one of those recordings? It doesn't have to be Mike, but any of the actors or actresses? Yeah, I do. It, it was Brad Pitt. When he was doing yeah. Boomhauer's brother, Patch, <laughs> um, 
he was, it was so funny because, because, you know, uh, Johnny was there and Mike was there and then, and then Brad would go, okay, do, do boom one more time, you know, so boom, uh, he would do the boom hour and then, then Brad would jump in with Patch and try to sort of mimic the timing and, oh, yeah, I'm a loser that, man, you know, I mean, it was really <laughs> funny to watch that back and forth. And, you know, uh, with, they had so many great actors on the show that mm. um, there was lots of fun to watch that. But for me, it was Brad Pitt, because once again, you, know, you want to talk about somebody really famous. I mean, you know, we went to lunch with him at the, at the Fox lot. Uh, and, you know, everybody would stop eating and turn around and everything. It was kind of crazy. But when we got back into the recording studio, you know, I got to sit and just talk with him about fly fishing. He had finished River Runs Through it yeah. a couple of years earlier. And I'm a big avid fly fisherman. And, uh, yeah, he was just like a guy talking about, yeah, man, you know, uh, got to watch your back cast. And, and you know, you want to make sure you clip the clip the hooks so they're a little bit more dull, you know. And he goes, I snagged myself once, but, I, you know, it was really fun. But yeah. that, that recording session was the best for That's me. That's really cool. That's really cool. Thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah. Now, with with something with something or not something with somebody like Brad Pitt, you know, you know, voted most handsome man for eternity. You're one of the biggest actors of all time. Was he a fan of the show when he just he wanted to get on the show, or was that something he that? Was. Uh, yeah, he was a fan. He was a big fan, and he was with Jennifer Aniston at the time, mm -hmm. and she was a big fan. And I think she was on an earlier episode, and she's like you got to do this show. Yeah. You got to do it. And, and yeah, he was a huge fan. I mean, even, I mean, when he was in there, when he wasn't doing his lines, he was laughing yeah. at, at Johnny doing his lines or whoever, you know, and everybody would laugh anyways when Johnny would do his lines. Um, so I want to talk about another, just David Copperfield on a mic. That guy was amazing, man. Yeah. Funnier. Yeah. Oh yeah. Just funnier and shit. Any, any time. And you know, it was really cool. Early on, we used to, John and I got so bummed because Dale used to have a cigarette in his mouth or he would use the cigarette as a prop when he was talking and making a point. And then Fox, you know, you know, get the cigarette out of there because it's a smoking thing. And it was such a bummer to lose that. But uh, yeah, Johnny would become Dale, man, on the spot. And it was believable. I mean, it was, it was, it was fucking amazing. Oh, I have Amazing. to imagine. There's there's two characters in particular, and, and both of them I, I love talking about. It's, it's I think they're the funniest and greatest comedic characters ever created in animation live action. Doesn't matter. Dale Gribble and Cotton Hill. Those two characters are I, they don't have to do anything on the screen. You just yeah. look at them the way they stand, the way they react, the way they whatever. It's 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 hilarity ensues, right? So obviously. Johnny is no longer with us. We're going to talk about two people and we'll do it back to back um, that are no longer here, man. So we're going to talk about Johnny first. Like I said, greatest The reason we're doing orange is because of that, that, that hat that, that uh, yes. Dale Gribble would wear, man. Um, so, oh, the Mac hat. Um, so you got a favorite Johnny story. I mean, I'm pretty sure you got hundreds of them, but does anything stick out? Uh, you know, I, I think for me, uh, it's what I just told you that to be in the recording studios and, and be with him and watch the mag magic happen, watch him become that character was the most fun for me, but off the mic, like if we were at a uh, animatic screening and he was there, um, you know, he would, cause he was a writer too. He was one of the writers and the voice mm -hmm. artists. So that was pretty cool. So he was at every animatic. He was just, uh, he was just a really, once again, it's going to sound redundant, but he was just a really nice guy. Yeah. And, and, you know, I had on my animatics, I think I directed seven or eight episodes and I had one go just incredibly super well, super successful. But most of the time I was executed on the spot, you know, literally head yeah. cut off and stomp on my body and throw it out the window. I mean, brutal, fucking brutal, brutal. You know, you would get uh, hours worth of notes and feel like you failed. Yeah. Um, and he, he was the guy that always would come around and go, hey, man, Clay, it's, it's going to be okay. It actually, this kind of worked and that worked. And, you know, you guys are going to get it. And he, he was great that way to sort of make you feel like, you know, you were still human and you could pull it off. Um, but just a warm, genuine guy. So it's such a crime that he's gone. Such Absolutely. Especially with the show coming back around, you know, it's just, yeah. it doesn't, uh, 
doesn't feel right. I know they, I, I know that the story is that they got a couple episodes or, or something along those lines before he passed away. Um, yeah. it, it's just, yeah. that's one of the hardest things looking forward to a reboot is knowing, you know, Brittany Murphy's not here, you know, and, right. and, and Johnny's not here. And, and, you know, it, it it just sucks, man. But I'm I'm glad that we did get what we got with 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 Johnny and with Brittany. Um, you know, sticking on Johnny for for just a second because I didn't I knew he was a writer, but I didn't know you know the depths that he was writing to until I just got to talk to all of you guys that I've had on so far and just hearing some of the stories that I've heard other people talk, talk about when it comes to Johnny. Did you get to work on any of the episodes that he wrote? Did you get to direct any? Yeah, of those? yeah the the Budasac episode, Traffic Jam. <laughs> I'm pretty sure he, he wrote and you know with Chris Rock. Yeah. Uh, so we got Johnny Hardwick, Johnny Hardwick and Chris Rock. I mean, that was a home run for me. Um, I don't think I did that episode justice looking back on it, and I haven't seen it in years, but now knowing what I know, I wish I could take another crack and do it again, man, because uh, you know, it it was already really funny, but I could have made it great. And I think it's just good. It's a solid good, but what uh, would Clay? What would Clay now change back then? What would you change? I would definitely. I mean, now that I really understand film far more, and I understand comedy far more, and camera setups far more than I ever did, um, it would just be far more enjoyable to watch. I guarantee yeah. it through staging and and really really making it work the best that it could work. I could do that now. I couldn't at that time. I, I did a, I did a satisfactory job. I did a good job, but I could make it great now with that material. It's not, it's not me. It's the material, but understanding the material now with the experience that I now have, you know, I didn't have that much then. So that's the difference. Well, I did the, the best good thing. I could at the time. Well, I'm going to tell you right now, dude, I went back and watched, I, I've said it so many times, man. I've watched this series so many times. This was a, this show and Hey Arnold, when I would deploy, was my security blanket. Whenever I was missing home, I'm popping one of these shows in. You know, it was King of the Hill one day, and then it was Hey Arnold the next day. So, hey going Arnold. back and rewatching, oh, fantastic show! Just a and just just really once again, um, very relatable, mm -hmm. and just a you know uh, a funny show. It, and and uh, you know when I I don't want to say sweet because that that doesn't sound right for it but it was just it, I guess it just made yeah very wholesome it just made you feel good to watch it it, yeah. it was just really well executed well executed they should bring that back that's one that they should bring back well they did with the 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 jungle movie they kind of wrapped up you know what he said and I've I've had Craig on twice now and he said that's something that they want. Well, not they, he wants it done. The fans want to see it done. You know, there's so many more stories they could have told that he's, he's alluded to that he wants to tell, um, you know, but he kind of got to wrap it up to an extent with the jungle movie that they did. Um, I, I mean, I would, I would love to see it. You know, the fact that I'm a 34 year old man that can still find enjoyment in that show can find enjoyment in King of the Hill. And now I've got an almost three year old. He, I, I had this little figure, this little Arnold figure and Gerald figure sitting on my desk and he comes in here and he takes all of my toys out of here and he somehow it makes it into his toy basket. And, uh, you know, he asked, you know, who is this? And I told him it's Arnold. And, and he was like, what is it? You know, and I, sh I showed him the cartoon and the kid, the kid is like, 80s kid 90s kid personified he comes downstairs whenever we get up in the morning i typically get up at about five o'clock in the morning on the weekends because he gets up and then he wants a bowl of captain crunch with the berries we sit down he's like daddy can we watch arnold can we watch trolls can we watch something so wow. you know it's it's cool awesome. getting to oh it, it's so great getting to share the cartoons that i grew up on that informed me and kind of helped raise and cultivate not only my personality but the how i how i interact with people and how i interact with the world you know king of the hill the sense of Ability, the humor, the heart, the the soul that was in that one. Same thing with Arnold. There's so many similarities between those two shows. Um, yeah. You know, I, I, I want to move off of Johnny for just a second and talk about a guy that is also no longer here. Man, I've I've, I've had such a blast hearing these stories about Ian. But when you hear the name Ian, man, is there anything that comes to mind? A story, a moment, uh, any, anything like that? Well, first of all, he was the world's biggest critic. I don't know if you've yeah. heard that. No, but. He uh, he was really, you know, the backstory on Ian is from Massachusetts, worked at Walden Pond as a as a security guard um, and uh, worked for 
the Seagram's family as a security mm -hmm. guard. So uh, really interesting background to then come to Hollywood and, and work on TV shows. But he wanted to be a writer. That's really deep down. He wanted to be a writer. And so and he was a really smart guy. And so he would, you know, as we were screening and going through our scripts, he would give us notes on like the structure of the script and maybe certain things that weren't working and stuff. And he was tends to, tended to be spot on. He was, he was really gifted that way. So I'll always be thankful for his little notes, even though sometimes I might have found them irritating. Mm -hmm. He was he was he was pretty spot on and pretty right. But he somehow got the nickname of Teddy, Teddy Wilcox uh, from Massachusetts. And and uh, and it was just kind of a funny, endearing nickname for him. Yeah. Um, and he was once again, just another swell guy, nice guy that that, uh, you know, was there at the studio, solid background artist. Um, and uh, once again, uh, really smart on story. Um, but I can remember one time at a Halloween party, he came as the Death Reaper. Um, and, you know, he was a tall guy. Uh, I'm 6'1". He was taller. He was probably like 6'3". Right. Um, and, and he went in full getup. He had the black, like, uh, cloth, cheesecloth over his face and a big cape and a big Sith and black gloves and black boots and everything. And I remember he didn't speak the whole time at the party. <laughs> <laughs> he, he was in character the whole time and it was so we all knew it was Ian you know uh, and then at the end he finally pulled it down and had some cookies or whatever but it was just so the guy was the guy was fantastically fun man and I just remember that sticking out uh, as the death reaper that time and of course his notes on on scripts he was really you know a, a gifted individual thank you Sweet for sharing those Thank you for sharing those. I, I know it's hard to, you know, sit there and think about people no longer here that you had such a, a meaningful time with, man, whether it was, you know, it sounds like to me, whether it was one moment, it was one month, it was one year, you know, it, it felt like a lifetime with some of the stories that you guys tell about Johnny, about Ian and about so many other folks that aren't here. So I appreciate you guys sharing those when they come up. Um, yeah. Now, with uh, the three episodes you picked, you sent me some really, really good ones. Obviously, we talked about uh, uh, Traffic Jam, and then we talked about Arrowhead. And then, of course, oh, shit, what was the other one? I blanked on the last one. Um, uh, what was it? Uh, uh, we Matanye. It was, um, shit. No, or, uh, the Order of the Straight Arrow, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah so Order of the Straight Arrow. Order of the Straight Arrow, Arrow was my, that was my first episode. You want to start with that one, or which one you want to start with? Because that was number, if you do, I mean, that's fine with me. Wherever you want to start. You tell me, man. Dealer's choice. You get to pick. Okay. So, my, yeah. First, my first episode, it was number three, first mm -hmm. season. And it was called Order of the Straight Arrow. And the show was, uh, like I had mentioned before, it was in its infancy. So we were still sort of figuring things out as we were gone. But Greg and, and, and Mike were definitely zeroed in on the comedy of what they wanted. So <clears throat> I had the orders, you know, to keep it real and keep it relatable, like from Mike mm -hmm. and, and Greg and, and, you know, try to try to understand the comedy that's in the script because, you know, it, when you watch, when you watch the episode on TV, it seems very simplistic and pretty straightforward. But when you get the script and you're sort of breaking it down and you're trying to visualize, you can get lost in details and, and it's really easy to miss things. So, you know, that was something that was always in the back of my mind to be careful of. But I was blessed with uh, John Rice was was going to help me on this episode. So it was him and I that basically storyboarded, storyboarded the whole episode. And back then, um, they, they weren't doing full layouts. They were We were basically doing a really nice detailed storyboard. In fact, I, I have a panel here that I'll show you that I actually pulled that I'm going to send to you. Oh, um, thank you. But uh, uh, so, you know, with Rice and myself, we basically spent about three months, I think, 24-7 uh, practically, never leaving. You know, I remember sleeping under my desk. And that's when I had, you know, a, one, a young wife, a three-year-old and a one-year-old. And we were like committed, Ooh. you know, never leaving. It, you know, I've heard you talk about that, too. So the hours are brutal on a TV mm. show. They're brutal. Um, but... Uh, you know, that was a great episode because not only was it really funny, but I also found it when, you know, when, when they talked about keeping it real and keeping it relatable, I was in the Boy Scouts and I actually received what they call a tap out 
which is you're around a campfire at nighttime and they tap you out. And I was inducted into Order of the Arrow. That's the mm -hmm. Boy Scout one. So this is straight arrow. They just added straight in front of it. Cheryl Holiday was the writer who's a really, really funny person as it is. And so, you know, I knew about Order of the Arrow. I knew about snipe hunting because we had to do that also. So, you know, I found it really relatable already for me with the, with the, with the story idea. So with John and I, and once again, John Rice, an amazing individual, amazing artist, uh, he really had my back on that. And we, we boarded it and we uh, screened it and it actually came out pretty well. And uh, I remember at the records, the woo loo loo, just everybody started <laughs> laughing. Everybody yeah. was laughing, you know, uh, doing that. So even Pam would break into it, you know, because Pam was Bobby. But, uh, you know, it was just, I don't know, shit. It was just really funny. It was a fun episode to work on. And uh, that was one of my bigger successes was that episode, for sure. 